So we want to get right to our guest. Joining me now, Dr. Robert Redfield. He is director of the CDC and a real pleasure to have you on the show, sir. So um, Americans have pretty much made up their mind about Thanksgiving. They've heard the guidelines. You believe, though, that we need to redouble our efforts in terms of mitigation. How do you think we should do that if people feel like they're already doing a lot? Well, it's very important, Dana, because, uh, you know, clearly right now you can see the surge that we're seeing in new cases, unfortunately, in hospitalizations and, and deaths. And I just try to remind the American public that we're not defenseless against this. We have powerful tools that we now know they work. Wearing masks, um, they, that works. Uh, social distancing, hand washing, being smart about crowds, uh, really mm -hmm. trying to be careful about what we do in, in, in indoor settings. These things really do work and they can really blunt this uh, current surge that we're having right now. And uh, hope's on the way with the vaccine, but over the next, uh, you know, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 weeks for many Americans, we still need to really be vigilant about these mitigation steps and stop the debate about whether they work or not. There's clear evidence that, for example, that masks do work in protecting individuals from both becoming infected as well as potentially infecting others. Could you speak to the status of the healthcare workers, the hospitalizations that we know are on the rise? You know, the, just how, how bad is that situation? It's not bad everywhere, but you, you, know, you do see enough stories of some hospitals having to even think about rationing care. Yeah, I think this is the real challenge that we have, you know, um, and I do think we have to be prepared. I think this issue of our health care system and the resilience that it has, and I think in some areas we are going to see the health care system uh, overwhelmed. And this is why, again, the vigilance in the mitigation steps is so important to keep those health care systems from going over the top in terms of, of, of being able to maintain their resilience, not just to serve people with COVID, but to serve Everybody. people without COVID. So I, I, yeah. I know that you are a big proponent of following the science and the data, and I want to talk about schools in a moment. But I do want to ask you this. So I read in the New York Times, um, say, you know, just that the available data right now doesn't say that small gatherings are a big problem. Do you dispute that? Yeah, I think for us right now, the majority of transmission that we're seeing across the nation, you know, this is much different than the fall, I mean, the spring when we had several metropolitan areas. Now we really have a large portion of the nation now that has uh, transmission at the level of what we call the uh, red zone. And we're of the point of view from the data that we have is that that the real driver now of this uh, epidemic now is not the public square. It really is driven by the silent epidemic, the asymptomatic infections, largely okay. in individuals between the ages, say, 12 and 35. And then when we come home to the safety of our own setting, mm. uh, not wearing masks, this is where the inter-household transmission is occurring. And that's Got why it. when you go look for a rural, like you're from Wyoming, you'd be yeah. a look, rural North Dakota, who would ever think rural North Dakota yeah. would be in the red zone? It's all in the red zone. It's really being driven by household Okay, gatherings. so then let me ask you, I know that you have said, you just said last week at that White House briefing that schools, you think, should and can stay open. We know that some of them are closing. What data point do they need or that you could, could you provide to ha help them get a plan to get schools to reopen? And how soon could parents see that? I mean, after the first of the year? Well, I think it's important for each of these jurisdictions, as I said, to do this not based on emotion, but based on data. So each of these jurisdictions have data in what's happened in their schools since they've opened. And I can say at a national level what we've seen is that we've seen the, that really the K through 12 schools have not been a source for significant outbreaks or for a significant acquisition. When we've gone into schools to evaluate the kids that are infected or the teachers infected, it turns out the teachers got infected from the community, from the, maybe their spouses and their family. But not the kids. Uh, the stu but not the kids. And the students didn't get infected in school, they got infected from their household or their community. So really, if you look at the data, and this is what I'm asking people to do, because each jurisdiction is going to make this decision, look at your own data and see how well has your school program worked. That's data, the programs that I've seen across the country, they've really worked remarkably well. Many people that were negative about opening schools now are saying, wait a minute, 
-hmm. We were able to do this safely and responsibly. And I think it's an important lesson for other industries that we want to keep open. Figure out how to do it safely and responsibly and follow the data, not the emotion that, oh, we must, we must close schools. I know the I parents schools... are very, very frustrated. And I understand it's a com complicated decision, but I think you're right. Follow the data and see where you go. Um, there's, there's good news on these vaccines. Um, I know that we're a few weeks off before some people start getting vaccinated, but how do you help decide and inform the decision-making process as to who gets the vaccine first? That's going to be the next real difficult problem to try to communicate to the public. Yeah, I think it's really important. First, it's you know exceptional that we have these vaccines, and it's very exciting. And again, it just reinforces why I want people to be vigilant, because we're turning the corner now. You don't want to be the last group to end up getting COVID, uh, because the vaccine is going to begin to be rolled out uh, probably by the end of the second week of December. Uh, initially, in a, in a hierarchical way, uh, uh, nursing home residents, and then some combination of healthcare providers and individuals at high risk for a poor outcome. And those decisions are in the process of being finalized as we speak. Um, I do think we'll have about 40 million doses of vaccine before the end of the first year Pretty of good. the year. That's enough to vaccinate 20 million people. But then it will continue through uh, January and February. And hopefully by March, we'll start to see vaccine available for the general public. Could, we, could I ask you about children? Because we talked about, you know, some kids, we do know that they become infected and they get sick. But we, what is the latest on the effects that COVID, if, you, if a kid does get it and they do have symptoms, do we have any more clarity as to how it affects them? Well, I will say first, uh, children obviously do get infected. Uh, secondly, they can f infect others, and they're probably, again, a driver of what I call the silent epidemic and the transmission within households. Um, third, it is correct that a majority of uh, individuals under 17, if they do get COVID, really don't develop symptoms. Uh, and, and obviously the mortality in that group is extremely, extremely rare. Um, you know, looking at the long-term consequences of COVID, I don't think any of us can go out there too far. We're studying it, trying to understand it. Uh, clearly, there's much more to COVID than just getting a respiratory illness, as we've seen. So, um, but in general, children uh, really are a group that are largely spared from Thank the goodness. consequences of COVID. And one last question for you in the minute that we have. I, you know, I read that no, and I guess this, is, this makes sense, um, no pregnant women were a part of the vaccine trials. Um, what about that going forward? How does that work um, so that we can make sure that those moms-to-be and their babies are also safe? Yeah, this is really important, uh, as you know, and, and, and how to begin that, uh, to get that safety data in the setting of pregnancy. Um, and I think you're going to see that happen fairly rapidly, um, just like we're going to see uh, studies uh, begin to look at um, the safety and immunogenicity in, in children, too. Uh, so those are priorities. Uh, obviously, it's pretty normal that we bring new products right. into humans. Mm -hmm. We really do spare pregnant women initially, uh, but I can tell you uh, that they're going to be um, uh, targeted to show safety and, and, and efficacy in that group very rapidly. Well, we appreciate you taking all of these questions. I could talk to you for the entire hour, but I know you're a busy man. You've got a lot to do. And happy Thanksgiving to you, Dr. Robert Redfield. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana.